The first thing I'd like to do here now is to reintroduce my crew. Uh, on my right is Scott Horowitz, uh, the mission pilot. To his right is Joe Tanner, uh, one of our spacewalkers. Next to him is Steve Hawley. This was Steve's fourth flight. Next to him is uh, Greg Harbaugh, another one of our spacewalkers. To his right is Mark Lee, our payload commander. And on the end is Steve Smith, the youngest member of the crew. This was Steve's second flight. The goal of our mission was to fly up to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, retrieve it, mount it in the bay on the servicing structure, uh, perform four EVAs uh, that were planned uh, to replace some of the major science instruments uh, with uh, modern technology that would allow the telescope to return more data at a faster rate, uh, and also to uh, replace some of the electronic components of the telescope. Uh, we were able to do uh, more than was planned, uh, if you include the MLI repairs that were uh, a late addition during the flight. Uh, the success of the mission is uh, directly attributable to thousands of people here on the ground, people who planned the flight, people who prepared the hardware, and uh, the people who trained the, the folks on the ground uh, in mission control and uh, who helped us train as a crew. And uh, we were really happy to be the ones that got to go up and see the telescope up close. Uh, we had a lot of fun and we saw some beautiful sights. Um, we brought a movie with us today and some slides to, to try and share some of that with you. So if we could get the lights down and, and start the movie. Well, something that was uh, great for me as the commander of this flight was not only did we launch on time, we launched two days earlier than the initial scheduled date when I was assigned as the, the mission commander. Uh, it started here at uh, about midnight as we walked out of the crew quarters and manned up the Astro van. And uh, a few hours later, the main engines lit to take us on up into orbit. Uh, you feel that rumble of the engines when they light outside, but you're not really sure till the SRBs light. Then there's a tremendous bright light reflecting off of the launch platform. It looks like somebody's welding right outside your window. And then you feel the, the kick in, in your back, and you know you're off. And uh, as you can see, we go through the clouds here at about 3,000 feet. Uh, I guess folks are a little concerned with weather, but uh, pretty soon we're VFR on top and uh, we're off on our way to space. Uh, SRBs are uh, kind of a bumpy ride. Uh, you're getting shook around. Uh, it was interesting around Mach 3, it smoothed out, and then shortly thereafter, the SRB sept, and uh, folks on the ground uh, at night got this beautiful view of the two SRBs as they tailed off and sept from the orbiter and looked kind of like a point of light, like a star going off into, uh, into orbit. Well, once we got to orbit, uh, the real work of the mission started uh, opening the payload bay doors and getting about the business of uh, turning our rocket ship into an on-orbit uh, spaceship. We had to uh, convert uh, the mid-deck to a working area, set up the tools and the uh, spacesuits in preparation for the spacewalks upcoming. Prior to the rendezvous, uh, as is normally done on flights like this, we check out the robot arm. The robot arm was a tremendously enjoyable piece of gear to operate, and uh, in our case, it, it checked out fully, completely, as it always does. It's a very reliable piece of gear. None of our simulators can fully prepare you for everything you're going to see during a rendezvous. Number one, the beauty of the real satellite as compared to our visuals, but also uh, the sun uh, in the real world and the confusion you can get on the flight deck just from the number of people who are up there helping out with the task. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a team effort with everybody uh, providing an input. Uh, but we managed to stabilize the telescope uh, like this in the COAS and bring it down so Steve could grab it. Uh, Scotty and uh, Sox were responsible for the first 330 miles or so, and my job was the last 10 feet. <laughs> um, they did such a good job with their part that my job was easy. We were able to grab it, and uh, uh, for Sox and me, it was, it was enjoyable to get to see it again and uh, got it berthed on the FSS so that the real mission uh, operations could begin with the EVAs. All right, here we are. Uh, this is a couple days into the flight. We need to check out the EMUs uh, first. As you know, these uh, EMUs were uh, updated. That's a new configuration that we hope to have on station. Once they're all checked out, it's time to don uh, the suits for uh, the first of the EVAs. I've got my uh, Green Bay Packers hat on here, which I wore every day, and I'm sure that was uh, one of the forces that kept us, you know, on target <laughs> the, whole, the whole time. Uh, uh, this is coming out of the hatch the very first day. It seems like I'm having a little trouble. I can't figure out why, but we had a lot. Of, you have a lot of cords and 
the umbilicals and you also have tools in your airlock and a lot of times it's it's hard to, to kind of get out the door but once we get out you can go ahead and start setting up for the day uh, the manipulator foot restraint handle was detached and uh, it was developed here at the Johnson Space Center real good job on that we went up and uh, hooked it on to the MFR and went to work the uh, first day the first of the five EVAs was uh, spent removing two large refrigerator sized objects from uh, the, the telescope here I am pulling out the uh, FOS instrument these instruments weighed between 685 and 850 pounds. Uh, after we pull out one of the old instruments, we then go get one of the new ones out of the payload bay, and this is STIS coming out. Of course, these um, boxes are designed to increase the scientific returns that Hubble will have. We um, are putting uh, STIS into the telescope here. Unfortunately, it happened at night. The major three boxes that we installed all occurred at night, so it made it a little bit more difficult task. That just is a matter of timing. Uh, after you put a new box into the telescope, you stow the old box, and this is stowing the uh, GHRS box. Uh, I might add that these scenes are all uh, sped up some, to some extent, about five times the normal speed. Everything goes a lot slower in space. Uh, this is just another view of stowing um, GHRS into the payload bay. You might notice over my left shoulder there's a, a gold-colored box. That's a new camera we had on board that actually brought the ground into uh, the work envelope, basically, and looked over our shoulder, and you'll see pictures of that in the upcoming scenes. The uh, EVA took about seven hours that first day. Often we had a chance to look out at beautiful sights. Notice the external airlock here also. That was the first flight of the external airlock. A gorgeous view. Well, after uh, Mark and Steve had shown us how to correctly perform EVA, it was uh, Greg and my turn on, on day two. And <coughs> you put your pants on uh, a little different in space. You can put both legs in at the same time. And suit up was uh, assisted by Doc uh, every time. And here's Greg uh, reporting that he was ready to go. Our job was to change one of the fine guidance sensors, and here uh, we are um, working on the doors to that bay, and here is the insertion, also done at night, as Steve noted, of the, uh, the new fine guidance sensor. This box weighs about 500 pounds, but in space it uh, doesn't feel like anything. Uh, here we are uh, stowing the uh, old SGS to return it to home, where it, it will be refurbished and launched on a future mission. We also changed out uh, one of the uh, science tape recorders, and that's the black box that I'm holding right there. And this is a beautiful shot of the Earth reflecting off the telescope. And uh, you can see Greg uh, behind me to, uh, to my left. Uh, once we got done with all the large boxes, the lower 12 feet or so has all of the you know, scientific instruments, we started going into the bays. And there's about uh, 15, 20 different bays that have the electronics that run the Hubble Space Telescope. In this case, I'm changing out a data interface unit, and the DIU had lost half of, it, essentially half of its capability, so we put a new one in. Uh, it's a little bit tougher task uh, than some of the normal EVA because it wasn't designed to be EVA uh, compatible. Uh, electro connectors uh, didn't have wing tabs, a lot of the other things that we tend to do, uh, like the reaction wheel that you see here. The reaction wheel uh, was one of those 12, 15 years ago when they first built Hubble. Uh, that was uh, meant to be changed out EVA. And when we weren't doing the work, the people inside were looking down. This is thunderstorms over the top of Houston. And it's certainly, it's like a string of firecrackers. Uh, it's probably the most incredible lightning display that, um, most, that any of us had ever seen from orbit. So it was pretty spectacular. And you were on the other end of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess here we are uh, getting uh, to work on uh, EVA-4. This is the solar array drive electronics box uh, change out. That's uh, Joe handing it off to me and then closing the lid and I'm on the uh, on the end of the arm there and I've got it uh, in my hands and we go up to go to the work site. Uh, I believe this is at sunrise so you'll see the uh, lighting change fairly <laughs> rapidly here and this is uh, real time. <coughs> Sun uh, goes up and goes down very quickly on orbit. Uh, Real uh, commendation to the folks who trained us. This task was just like it was uh, in the training process, uh, except the uh, screws were, they, although they were equally small, they weren't nearly as corroded as they were in the water. But it was, uh, it was a challenging uh, task to change that, that solar ray drive electronics box, but it was very doable the way uh, it was designed by the engineers. And there are Joe and I up at the top of the telescope uh, we're not paying any attention to the Earth up there, <laughs> uh, changing out uh, or putting some covers on magnetometers. 
One of the efforts that was underway while we were out there uh, was Scott was working on some other repairs, some patches that were uh, designed and, and uh, built up by Scott uh, in the course of that EVA day. Uh, I had, uh, Joe and I actually put a couple patches on towards the end of EVA day four, but then Mark and Steve put on the remainder of the patches on an unscheduled EVA day five. Uh, that all uh, went absolutely superbly. Uh, the design developed by the folks on the ground with the stuff available to us was, uh, was just great. Real uh, kudos to everybody that was involved in that. Uh, towards the end of uh, that activity, then we, were, we finished up and it was the end of the EVAs. With the EVAs mm -hmm. successfully completed, it was time to uh, let Hubble fly free again. And it's a little bit, I guess, like having your kids come home from college. You know, we were really happy to see Hubble when it showed up, and when it was time to send it off, we were really happy to see it go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, I got to grapple it and uh, uh, raise it up off of the FSS, bring it forward in the bay, uh, release it from the arm, and then I uh, told Scott uh, to go ahead and execute the maneuver, which he did. Um, the maneuver was kicked off by uh, firing the forward jets, and as, and as soon as we did that, uh, we fired the jets. The orbiter went back, and the telescope flew right over the top window. This is a view uh, right over our heads, uh, looking out the uh, starboard window. And uh, it was pretty amazing to see this large telescope fly right over our heads. Uh, the maneuver, after uh, the telescope went out of the window, took us so it, we like, flew like a loop over and atop the uh, telescope. So the next thing we saw, about 15 minutes later, was the telescope. Uh, flying over uh, Sharks Bay, Australia. We saw a lot of Sharks Bay. Um, never got tired of it. Never got tired of it. It was a beautiful sight. And then we got to see the telescope, almost like a telescope riser set as it goes across the horizon with the beautiful blue uh, planet in the background. It was quite an amazing sight. Of course, our, uh, our calling theme the whole time was more power to the telescope. And <laughs> here we are celebrating the fact that telescope has more power. Um, Sox was in real trouble because Valentine's Day had come and gone and he hadn't written home yet. <laughs> so he's, he's catching up. And this is a demonstration <laughs> of one of the uh, real problems with using power tools on orbit. <laughs> and uh, this is a study in hydrofluid mechanics. But it's uh, interesting to note that the uh, little M&Ms will float right in the middle of the water ball. It makes kind of a pretty picture to show your kids. <laughs> Exercise is an important part of daily life on orbit, just as it is on Earth. But uh, we have a little bit better view. And if you find a, a scene that you want to take a picture of, you ask for a camera that on Earth weighs uh, quite a bit, and someone just passes it over to you. Sox's uh, motto was, a, a clean ship is a happy ship. And he got us all <laughs> busy cleaning up. And we were real fortunate to get some excellent views of the Hale-Bopp uh, comet that is still visible in the morning sky right now. Our uh, first landing opportunity was waved off due to uh, bad weather at the Cape, and so, but we didn't mind. We got this extra view of uh, Florida flying over. You can see Orlando and uh, the Cape and Miami. This is what it looks like inside during a night entry. Uh, you get flashes from the plasma in the overhead windows that, that light up the inside of the ship, and you can see the orange glow uh, from the fireball. That's what the orange glow looks like from the outside, um, and that's uh, pretty much the view that folks here in Houston saw as we streaked overhead at a couple hundred thousand feet. It was great for me. I looked out my left window, and there was Houston. I could see the street outlines, and uh, right at the lower window frame was where the Johnson Space Center should be. This is the first flight at the uh, Kennedy Space Center where we had centerline lights on the runway. Uh, it was a really nice addition to the runway. Uh, gave me a good feel during the landing and the rollout for where I was uh, on the runway. Scott did a super job getting the drag chute out. And then we uh, tapped the brakes just to check them and make sure they worked. We really didn't need the brakes with the wind that we had that day. But uh, as a pilot, I wanted to see what they felt like. And they were beautiful. <laughs> Jettisoned the, the chute and, and rolled to a stop there on the runway. 103 had been a great place to live and a, and a great place to work. The, the whole 10 days we were up in space. And uh, I was kind of sad to see it come to an end. Uh, it's always tough when you when you end the mission. You know uh, you're not going to be spending as much time with with your crew as you got to during the the previous ten days. The movie's great for for seeing how things move in space, but uh, nothing can quite beat the still imagery, the the slides that we get. Um, so we've got a lot of them 
to show you today. Uh, this is our crew patch. Uh, it was actually pretty easy to do this patch, and we took the image of the telescopes directly from a picture from the first servicing mission, and that's why the arrays look a little bit twisted. Uh, but it looked just like that when we got back up and rendezvoused with it. The uh, night launches is just spectacular. Uh, my first flight was on a day launch, and um, you know the forces are all the same, but, but the light show out your window is pretty incredible. In fact, it's pretty hard to see the stars and the beach uh, as you take off because the light is so bright from the flames that surround you. I talked about the sun and the rendezvous. I use my thumb a lot, an old fighter pilot trick, attack pilot trick, too. Uh, you just take your thumb and put it up in the window to block out the disk of the sun, and, and that worked great uh, to keep the sun out of my eyes during the approach. Uh, this is what the telescope looked like at it about 1,500 feet. The uh, aperture end was pointed towards us, and as we uh, continued the rendezvous, the telescope actually rotated 180 degrees until we were in close. The uh, bottom end of the telescope was pointed down at the payload bay, uh, and then we uh, went inertial so that we matched the exact rate of the telescope, uh, and then drifted in another 100 feet or so till uh, Steve was able to grab it. I know uh, Sox and I talked a lot uh, during preparations for the flight that we each felt very fortunate to have a chance to be able to see the Hubble telescope twice, and we had exchanged memories about what it looked like and, and of course we had told the other crew members uh, kind of what to expect and how pretty the satellite was. And I know Sox used to say that he remembered being able to uh, uh, see the reflections of the earth in the telescope such that the telescope actually looked bluish rather than silver and, and one of my recollections was uh, at the Terminator it was the sun setting or, or rising would would shine on the solar rays such that it almost appeared that the solar rays had their own source of illumination. And this is a picture of kind of what that looked like. The, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a treat, a special privilege to see the telescope again. Uh, the side that you see here, which is the side that, that was facing us as we uh, did the, the grapple and the berth, actually looked quite a lot like, like I remembered it from before. Uh, it wasn't until we had a chance to see the other side that uh, we realized there's a difference between the side that preferentially faces the sun and, and the side that doesn't. And, and of course, that led to the uh, MLI repair activities later on. But uh, uh, it, it's a big spacecraft, and it's, it's truly a beautiful spacecraft. Uh, we all had different duties uh, on the EVA days and leading up to the EVAs. Uh, my job uh, was uh, getting the guys are up and ready to go when Joe and I were not going out the door ourselves. Uh, one of the things we all took care of ourselves was wiping down our own helmets and putting the anti-fog in there. Next slide, Sox. <clears throat> uh, so here is Mark, and the next slide is Steve, uh, getting ready for uh, their first EVA, and they're all pumped up and ready to go. So we got uh, these guys all suited up and, and uh, uh, pre-breathed and all that, and then it was uh, time to hand off to Joe, who directed the operation from there. So Steve uh, and I, on our off EVA days, acted as the IV, or the person, uh, the choreographer, I guess, of the, of the EVA task. And uh, we pretty much stayed glued to uh, W9, uh, the window, looking at everything that was going on and keeping track uh, of the activities and making sure that uh, the EVA was going as, uh, as we had trained and as we had planned. Of course, we were always uh, assisted ably by Dr. Stevie, and we refer to Steve and Dr. Stevie in that way so as not to get them confused. But uh, Steve, uh, Dr. Stevie uh, and Steve and I all worked together closely to uh, uh, make sure the arm movements uh, were, uh, were what we had uh, trained and planned on, and it was, uh, it was really a team effort. Uh, with socks, you can't see him in the picture, but he's right behind us acting worried. <laughs> <laughs> And here Steve is, uh, is handling uh, one of the large boxes, and that uh, is probably uh, GHRS uh, being stowed on the, on the aft fixture. Uh, and while uh, we, st we stowed them temporarily there while we uh, got the new uh, instrument out of uh, one of the protective enclosures, 
and install the new instrument in the telescope and then retrieve the old instrument for stowage in what is now an empty closure. Uh, this is a, during the first EVA, Mark and myself. Um, you can see this large enclosure in the front is where the new instruments launched and the old instruments were stowed for entry. Uh, that's uh, myself on the arm there. You can see the camera is uh, right in front of my face here, that silver box. Mark is in the back inspecting the uh, enclosure there. This is the uh, other large box that uh, we moved during the flight, the fine guidance sensor. That's Joe on the arm holding it. As he mentioned before, it weighs about 500 pounds. We often refer to it as the piano because it was uh, about the size and shape of a, a grand piano. You see Greg in the back inspecting the uh, bay after Joe has removed uh, the old instrument. Also, you'll notice uh, Greg has a tether uh, going down by his right leg there. He was always tethered to the uh, shuttle in that respect. You also notice near his left foot is a foot restraint that we actually installed on the telescope to give Greg a platform somewhat like what Joe was using on the end of the arm. I might add that uh, Joe and I compared notes after the flight just to, to describe how things went in space as they did on Earth, and it really was very, very similar. We each had installed these large boxes, I'd say about 30 to 35 times on Earth before we did it in space. Each of us got about 135 to 150 hours of water time before the flight also. Well, at the end of uh, a lot of the replacement work on the uh, telescope, but one of our goals was to actually raise the telescope to a higher orbit. Uh, the uh, telescope doesn't have any engines. It just has the reaction wheels to maintain attitude. And so over time, even though there's very little atmosphere up there, what little atmosphere there is will drag the telescope down. So we did what's called a vernier reboost, and you heard some people were rewarded for their efforts because this is a pretty unusual way to use the space shuttle to boost a payload because the little vernier jets really weren't designed for that. So they came up with a very clever procedure uh, that basically faked the jets out into boosting us into a higher orbit. And we spent uh, 82 minutes uh, using the little vernier jets over the entire mission and boosted the telescope about eight miles higher, which will uh, ensure that it has a very safe orbit for years to come. Uh, these next four slides uh, typify some of the uh, the work that we do uh, pre-flight and in-flight, and it's the interaction between the astronauts and the engineers and the ground team and all, of, all the designers that allow you to pull off some of this work. For the data interface unit, it's something even before the crew was named, uh, we had three or four runs over at the NBS at Marshall, and we knew that it would be difficult to do because of reaching access in the bay, so they designed umbilicals, uh, gender changers for some of the connectors that were powered, uh, so on and so forth, and the end result is you've come up with something uh, through iteration that really works works well. Next. And that's particularly true about the solar array drive electronics task, which we did have difficulty on STS-61 because some of the screws came out, but through uh, the good work of uh, the engineers up at Goddard and inputs from the crew, we were able to come up with a design that made change out of the box uh, much, much easier uh, to do. and basically eliminated the, the possibility of losing uh, connectors. Uh, all that interaction takes place before the flight, and then even in flight, the same people are able to work on the uh, multi-layer insulation repair kits where they look at all the things on board, and I've heard a lot, some of the reporters that have talked uh, to me you know, after the flight talk about Apollo 13. It's the same sort of uh, effort where the people on the ground throw everything they've got in a room and they all come up with the best solution uh, to the problems that we have. And once Doc uh, used all the uh, kit that we had on board to fabricate them, uh, we were able to go outside and uh, put them on and they worked just the way uh, the people designed them. If you take the pictures of what they had at the NBL and compare them to what we had up in space, they're virtually identical, which shows you know, what great work they do on the ground to get these things ready. This is a wide shot from the, the, uh, the aft flight deck. One of the things you should note is the external airlock in the uh, foreground. Again, it was the first flight where we didn't have the airlock inside the cockpit. Instead, it was outside. And again, a beautiful view of uh, the Earth with Hubble in front there. It's uh, Mark and myself doing some of the MLI repair. I might add that on my first flight, I was at 120 nautical miles, which is the lowest the shuttle goes. And I had a very interesting view at that altitude. And this was the highest the shuttle goes. So it was a real contrast for me. And you notice the curvature of the Earth was very pronounced in that last picture. Uh, here we see, you see the enhanced spacesuit that we wore. Uh, we had four people that did spacewalks on this flight, but we only took three spacesuits in order to save weight. In order to do that, the spacesuit had to be resizable very easily in orbit. And folks here at the Johnson Space Center 
uh, as well as a couple of the contractors up in the northeast, came up with this new way to resize suits during the flight. Joe and I shared one spacesuit, the one you see here, uh, over the five EVAs. It worked very well. Next slide. On uh, the second EVA, the customer asked us to go take a look at some of the solar rays. You'll see Joe here at the top of the picture and Greg uh, on the back of the arm here with uh, the removable EVA camera. That's what's in Joe's right hand there. And they actually did a real-time survey of the solar rays to help the customer determine why one of the panels on the solar rays wasn't uh, operating as efficiently as some of these other solar rays. You'll see this camera in use uh, likely during the space station here because it turned out to be very, very useful on our flight. Uh, we also had a 35-millimeter camera out there, a Nikon F3. Uh, this is what uh, we often saw when we were up on the arm about 35 or 40 feet above the payload bay, and we would look back at the cockpit. So we're looking forward. You see the four windows of the cockpit, two facing aft, two facing up, the external airlock at the lower part of the screen, and to the right is the KU band antenna that we use for communication. Uh, going back to that uh, slide that you saw a moment ago with Joe and I uh, looking up at that solar ray, uh, what you don't see in that slide is the incredible view of the Earth that we had in the background. Uh, it was very difficult for uh, me on the back of, hold, of the arm there uh, to not be staring at the Earth and keep my mind on the, the solar ray that we were trying to inspect, but uh, it was just an absolutely spectacular view. Uh, this is Mark holding that camera again, and I must say I think we've sort of set a precedent here that is uh, most likely to be followed in satellite servicing from here on out in terms of use of a camera out uh, with the EVA crew members. It uh, was absolutely invaluable uh, both for us on board, but more importantly for the folks on the ground to assess the condition of the satellite and the the state of the task uh, once we completed it. So it really proved its worth over and over again. You can see on the top of it is a little uh, light. Uh, it's a, actually a modified helmet light that was attached to the top, and we use that to illuminate the work site. Every now and then, if you take enough pictures, you're going to get lucky. And I, <laughs> I have to admit, I would love to say that I planned this picture, but it, I think it was just pure luck. That's Joe. and. Uh, it just turned out absolutely uh, spectacularly, I think. Uh, you can, if you look at it, uh, maybe not here, but in, if you study the, uh, the, the photograph, you can see Joe's face, and it, it really just turned out nice, so I'm, I'm really proud of that photograph. Uh, the work the EVA guys have described, uh, being able to, to perform servicing activities like this is obviously going to be very important as we move into space station. Uh, it's probably worth noting as well that the uh, ability of the uh, robotic arm to move around heavy payloads and to uh, position EVA crew members with precision is also going to be an important component of, of our uh, suite of skills that we're going to need as we enter space station construction. Uh, again, after the su successful completion of the five EVAs, uh, we were ready to uh, let Hubble go back and perform its mission. Our contribution to, to Hubble was uh, pretty much at an end at this point in the flight. Uh, of course, there's a lot of activity still ongoing by the rest of the Hubble team to check out the, the new <coughs> instruments, the new electronics that, that were installed, and, and all that checkout's going very well. So we're very hopeful that we really will leave Hubble with more power and, and better than it was when we found it. Um, all it's been able to do over the last seven years with the 1970s technology has fundamentally changed the way we, we think of our universe and our place in it and our understanding of it. And uh, it, it's amazing to me to, to even speculate on what 1990s technology will allow Hubble to do. So there's great promise and everybody that, that had a chance to work on the, the telescope um, either previously or part of 82 or, or on a future mission is contributing to something that that I think will be a tremendous legacy for the human race for, for years and years to come. Well, we saw this view in the, um, in the movie. It happened uh, pretty fleetingly because it, it went by so fast. So it's real nice to have a still. And uh, we'll look at the sequence here of, of the Hubble during the deploy. And as you look at the sequence, I just want to note um, as we go through it, 
it was really uh, amazing to work on the Hubble. Uh, we were very focused. The crew was you know, working very hard. The ground was working very hard. And uh, even all the way up to deploy. And at this point, I guess it hit me what we had just done. I mean, um, we had planned, and everyone had worked really hard for all these years to get ready for this mission. And now we were releasing Hubble to go out and, and do its job. And, and it was really a beautiful sight. And uh, as we release the Hubble and it goes off to explore the universe, you know, uh, I looked at it with the hope someday of maybe coming back to visit it again because it's, it's, it's an amazing um, thing that we do. And hopefully uh, the returns will uh, produce scientific results that will improve uh, life for all of uh, the people of the world. And uh, you have to have the obligatory crew in uh, orbit photo. And of course, you can tell it's in orbit with the Hubble. You can see the solar rays and the piece of the telescope there in the background. And I just want you to note the, uh, the wonderful use of color there. Uh, navy blue is a wonderful color. <laughs> <laughs> navy blue, good. <laughs> Of course, here's our more power sign that really summed up, as we said earlier, what we had intended to do to the telescope. And we felt, uh, after we had completed the five EVAs, that, that we truly left the telescope in a, in a more power situation. And we were pretty happy. You can see relief on the faces of everybody at, uh, uh, about the mission uh, being successfully accomplished. You, you read that correctly. <laughs> they wanted to put that up on the telescope, and I uh, <laughs> had to put my foot down. <laughs> Of course, uh, Sox uh, spent a fair amount of time in the windows. Uh, he made uh, a challenge to Doc that he couldn't shoot up all of the film that we had left on board after the telescope was gone. And the telescope's still here right now, but we were shooting uh, some Earth, Earth obs. Uh, most of our photos that you've, you've seen so far are of the telescope, but we did take a few beautiful shots of uh, Australia, and this next one is certainly one of the best. This is uh, Spencer Bay in, uh, I guess, northeast Australia. And we covered every inch of Australia and, and <laughs> enjoyed it every time it came by. <laughs> well, we like to take pictures of uh, all the dirt we see for the geologists. But we like to take uh, pictures of the clouds and water, too. And so here's one of our prettier pictures in that category, the sun glint and the terminator. It had been about uh, over a year since Discovery had flown before this flight, and we couldn't find the key. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to make our own on orbit to make sure we could come home. Uh, we're going to give that to the next crew, and hopefully they'll be able to pass it on to, to crews beyond them. Uh, 103 was a fantastic vehicle to fly in. Uh, Discovery gave us no problems uh, during the flight. That's because of all the work that had been done so well by the people on the ground. And it really enabled us to focus on the mission of fixing the telescope. Well, every mission has to come to an end. Uh, here's our empty payload bay, uh, the sun setting. Uh, not long after this, we closed the payload bay doors and, uh, and came home. Touchdown uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. We felt good after the mission um, because we were pretty sure we hadn't busted anything. <laughs> and I can't tell you what a relief that is. 